have a very exciting talk. Please welcome Chris Heavily, VP Innovation Techstar, and the journalist Faudi Rahal will talk us through some success stories and what we can learn from that. Please welcome them. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm really pleased to have uh, with me today uh, Chris Hively. Uh, Chris is uh, very well uh, known, of course. He's the uh, original co-founder of MapQuest. I think anybody above uh, 30 years old remembers uh, MapQuest. He's uh, currently uh, SVP of Ecosystem Development or Innovation. He's also Enterprise and Residence uh, at Techstars. I think he's been dubbed the Startup Whisperer. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Fauzi Rahal, and I'm really looking forward to this far ch uh, side chat with you today. Uh, likewise, I'm, I'm happy to be here and I can't wait to have a great conversation. Hopefully there's some nuggets in there for everyone. Uh, Chris, are you still boarded up in North Carolina? Yeah, we're still boarded up. I'm at, uh, at, at a really nice house that we have, a kind of a weekend cottage. And uh, I just figured if I'm going to be boarded up, you might as well be boarded up in front of a beautiful lake. So uh, I'm very inspired right now. For sure. Um, Chris, our conversation today is about innovation and what people could learn from the world's most famous success stories. Uh, you're one of the best to tell us about this. Uh, you Not only have you uh, founded and exited MapQuest, but you've been executive in uh, a few of the world's leading companies. You're now doing amazing work at Techstars. I know you're also equally uh, quite involved with Startup Weekend. You've recently written a book called Build the Fort. Um, where do we begin about thinking about famous success stories? And can you help us define success stories before we uh, kind of move on and get some nuggets of information from you? Well, I'd love to kind of broaden the typical definition of success. Um, a lot of times we just look at success as kind of uh, financial success and only kind of look at large, you know, maybe success is defined with a B as in billions of dollars. And uh, I'd love to kind of just kind of put that to the side and talk about success in lots of different ways. And, and uh, you know, some of the best entrepreneurs I've seen, you've never heard of. And just because they haven't had a billion dollar success doesn't mean I don't think they've done an amazing job. So let's broaden that definition. Uh, I love really good small companies in you know, tier two or tier three cities, cities that we may not even have heard of. And, and uh, I love those entrepreneurs as much as uh, maybe the ones that get a lot more press. Okay, well, so looking at that kind of successful uh, individual, successful founders or success stories, uh, can you uh, give us a little bit of, uh, you know, a, a start to what kind of companies come to mind or what kind of individuals come to mind when we talk about these things? Well, let's, let's start at the, you know, the very, 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 did I say very, very beginning of an entrepreneurial journey, the, 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 the decision and the, and the first step of taking an idea and putting that idea into action. I mean, okay. I, I, when I go around the world and I ask, you know, raise your hands if you've ever had a kind of an, I, an idea for a company and, you know, 95% of the people raise their hands. And then I say, leave your hand up if you've actually kind of launched something or started working on it. And, you know, almost all the hands go down. And, and why is that? It's because that first step from idea to action is scary, right? For most of us who have never uh, been an entrepreneur before, we don't, you know, like the, 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 uh, the unknown scares us and, and prevents us from making that leap. So anybody who's actually put an idea to me, like has already started on their, their, their road to success. Um, because if you, do, it, and that, this is why I go back to what I said before, if you define success as only a financial exit, then you've missed all the successful midpoints, like deciding to do something, maybe even quitting your job or, you know, maybe deciding that, um, you know, you're gonna side this as a side hustle, right? Like to me, I, I put a huge amount of, um, of uh, goodwill and, 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 and uh, I can't think of the word I'm thinking about. It's too early in the morning for me here. Uh, you know, anybody who does that to me is, is successful, right? Who has decided to try something out and put it into action let alone then starting to actually, you know, maybe get a customer or a product. Those are all really interesting kind of metrics to look for in terms of success. And, you know, when I look at, a, at, at someone who has taken an idea, put it, you know, launched it, put it into, into action and, you know, has five or 10 customers and maybe two or three people, I, I, I get as much warm feeling about them as I do someone who's, you know, made the big media press. So. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe we need to start looking at uh, some of these midpoints 
as uh, as ways, you know, because by the way, you and I, we can help those people, right, on that journey, right? And that's what makes for a great community. And I could just keep going on and on. <laughs> Chris, would you consider fa would you consider failure at achieving things um, also part of that success? I would, yes, very much so. I would say anytime someone takes a swing at something and does it, you know, in an in a, in a, in a all in a good fashion, you know, and, and, and by the way, I have much more failures than I have successes, right? I mean, there's, you know, my, my desk in the office is littered with ideas that never saw the light of day. I, mean, I just, I just got a shutdown from one of my, one of my peers and one of the people, you know, Brad Feld, who I, who I really enjoy and enjoy his brain. And I threw an idea at him and he goes, not bad, but nah, you know? So like, if, if you're not doing that, you know, so yeah, that's, I'm happy. I'm still throwing ideas out there. <laughs> Can we bring this a bit into the context of uh, today, the elephant of the room, COVID, um, a lot of unknowns, a lot of uncertainties going on, a lot of uh, people doing great things, not even knowing if that's the right thing for them to do. Um, what, what is your advice to, I mean, from the audience of uh, Techni today, we have everyone from like angels to corporates to startups, and I'm sure you're familiar with that uh, huge broad ecosystem. What are the things that we should all look at, look out for today that, that are, you know, interesting or uh, not normal uh, situations of success in this new normal world that we are in? It's a great question. Um, obviously, the world has changed, right? How, I mean, we're not sitting in our normal places, you know, I'm not sitting on stage with you, right? Yeah. You know, in, in Cairo or, or Alexandria, you know, like we did last year. Um, so the world, the, you know, like the rules, the chairs have all been rearranged, right? That's the perfect time for you to take an idea and, and go with something. Everything is being disrupted, everything, right? We're all doing everything differently. And in that, People don't know where the chairs and the tables and, you know, the rules are all going to change. That's a perfect time for someone with an idea to just twist something good enough to work in today's environment. Um, none of us know what the world will look like in a post-COVID world. But I know it's not going to look like the pre-COVID world, right? Something's going to be different. Um, just look at remote work. I think remote work has changed forever. We still had a ton of companies refusing to accept remote work, right? And now they're understanding, well, maybe I don't need that 50,000 square foot building. Maybe I only need 20,000 for an occasional stuff. And I'm getting just as much, if not more productivity out of some of my people. So that's a lot of money to save that could be put into other things. Anyway, that's just one silly example of how something is going to change. And so if you have an idea or you're an entrepreneur, whether it's not, it doesn't have to be related to COVID specifically, just that our behaviors and our actions will be different. And in that is an opportunity to kind of maybe look at something from a different angle, right? And therein lies what a great idea entails, you know, some action or behavior that's looked at from a different angle. And that angle of attack fits better today than it did maybe, you know, pre-COVID. Um, is it is it is it a good time to build something now? Uh, of course, now there's tons of new problems that, uh, as you just mentioned, uh, need solutions uh, today. Um, is it also as simple as, well, I've lost my job anyway, or I don't know when I'm going to get my job back, or things are slow. Uh, let me do something. And if I don't have anything right now in terms of an idea, I know, um, I know, I know you you uh, <coughs> you've used that term quite a few times, and you guys at uh, TechStars use it, uh, which is give first. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how that could help a lot of people, you know, get things going and feel more successful and achieve things? Yeah, I mean, I got two or three different answers in here, so keep me in, keep me in line in the lane, and, and, and I'd like to hit a couple. In a few different minutes. <clears throat> let's let's start with, you know, it's a great time to start something, and if you're sitting on the bench um, uh, because your company, you know, has you furloughed or or you're removed, and you know, maybe they'll hire you back when things change you're sitting there, this is a perfect time to build some skills at really with no cost, right? You're, you're sitting there, you're dead in the water, right? You might as well figure out how to do something. And so if you have an idea or even the, 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 the crude versions of an idea, go scratch at it, go, go learn how to be an entrepreneur, go, go learn some entrepreneurial skills. Um, and, and, you know, you never know what happens you know, 
I always say like, if you treat that thing, that curiosity of, of how to see if your idea can take form, if you have the curiosity about that, go scratch at it, go treat that as a job, right? Go spend, you know, wake up, shower, right? You know, go down to your office or your, your, your third bedroom or your, you know, your kitchen table or your garage and go scratch at this. Start, re, you know, and I, we can talk all about, how, you know, some of these first steps, you know, that I outlined in, in the book, Build the Fort. Um, the second thing is, if you don't have an idea, go volunteer, go find a friend, go, go, go to a startup weekend, go, go, you know, do some email and some web searches and figure out who's working on something and then say, listen, I'd like to help. You don't have to pay me anything. I want to learn what it's like to be an entrepreneur. I want to learn what it's like to be in an entrepreneurial company. And, uh, you know, if something good starts happening, you know, maybe you pay me, maybe not, but like volunteer, you're sitting at home doing nothing anyway, right? Um, all of that is about a curiosity about how something works. Um, uh, entrepreneurial startups are not smaller versions of big companies. And so you got to learn that by diving in and kind of, you know, diving into the pool and getting all wet. That's the only way you can understand how a startup works. I guarantee if you go back to your corporate job, you'll bring a new set of skills and experiences that will help you for the future. Chris, this was amazing. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, I think we're run out of time. I could uh, ask you another dozen questions and get a, another dozen nuggets from you. Um, thank you for everybody who's attending and uh, look forward to chatting with you again soon. Thanks for having me. Good luck. Thank you very much. That was impressive. Allow me to introduce the A team, a panel moderated by Tudura Pan 2, International PR and Techni Summit Dubrovnik, and the speakers. Mike Docker, Global Accelerator in Vala Private Capital, Lisa Ateya, Strategy Consultant in TBD Group, Ahmed Pirari, Director in Startup Grand Warsaw, discussing how to build a global impact business starting at zero. Please give them a hand. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Techni 2020. I'm Teodora. I'm part of the Techni and the Med Angels team. And I'm very excited to be hosting a panel on a very important topic for us right now in time and history. It's called Building Beyond Ourselves, How to Build a Global Impact Business Starting from Zero. It's a very important topic, especially I know we have a lot of startups and aspiring entrepreneurs watching. So um, we have some very interesting, and very exciting speakers uh, joining me tonight to answer your questions. So we have Ahmed Pirai, who's the director of Startup Grind from Warsaw. Ahmed, you can say hi. Hi. And you're joining us from Warsaw right now. Exactly. So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm still in the office. I mean, with the proper social distancing. And uh, yeah, so up and running. Super cool. Um, so then we have Lisa Atia, who's strategy and growth consultant at TBT Group LLC, who's joining us from LA or San Francisco? Los Angeles, yes. Hi. Cool, Lisa, thank you for coming. And then we have Mike Ducker, who's the Executive Director at Walhalla Global Accelerator and who's joining us from Maryland, the US, I believe. Uh, correct, just right outside of Washington, DC. Cool, this is a very exciting international um, panel in line with our topic tonight. So, um, okay, let me start with a philosophical question. Um, Right, we're in a very interesting time in our lives. It's unprecedented. I think anyone can agree on that. So um, we have to rethink how we do business, how we live, how we consume, how we invest, everything. But my first question is, in, in, a, in a world post-COVID, when so much has happened, because as humanity, we've been expanding into nature, uh, destroying habitats, and maybe this is one of the reasons why we came in, in touch with this bad coronavirus. So in this context, is it even ethical to try to aspire to, to have global impact or should we focus more on our local communities? Ahmed, we can start with you if you want. Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, first of all, we have to understand that we're in the same boat. So if we would only want to focus on our local ecosystem, I don't think that anything is going to be impactful. And uh, I'm always one of those people that I'm usually more of a, let's just say, a person who tries to say things from a reality point of view than being politically correct. So if you only want to focus on our local ecosystem, if you're running some business out of, let's just say, uh, Brazil, 
maybe for your local ecosystem, the best thing is to just cut the trees and then try to make sure that your country is going to somehow have a better GDP per capita. While you're in global, you're destroying the whole ecosystem. If at the same time you try to close the borders and then try to only focus on one local ecosystem, you don't know that there is an innovation that is happening right at the, you know, the other country or in the other ecosystem that you can benefit from that. And especially because of uh, being massively related to, let's just say, software developments and things that they are not even physically needed to be moved from one location to the other. The moment that you're looking for the right mindset, the moment that you're looking for the right idea, as you can see right now, we are literally, let's just say, feeling that we are in the same room together while everybody is joining from another location. So the company can easily uh, operate uh, from a local point of view while everybody is from one location. So if you only want to focus on your local ecosystem, then how do you want to really operate with people that one of your developers is from one continent and the other is from another? So that's why I really believe that globalization is definitely is not a problem uh, that, uh, you know, like we're facing these days. Maybe uh, not being aligned with what we are sacrificing and what we're achieving might be the biggest issue. Mm, very interesting. Lisa, you deal with growth and I know you have a, a big concern for ethics. Um, what do you think about this, this question? Yeah, so I actually want to take the opposite point of view because I think focusing locally is focusing globally. And to Ahmed's point, it, it's that we are all connected. We're all in the same boat. We're all recognizing all of the things that are not working anymore, right? And so we are having to literally reimagine a new world, literally create new systems, right? That work for all of us. But you can't do that until you truly understand what's needed within your own community. How are you able to go to other parts of the world and, and it's that same, it's that same like conquer mindset that I'm going to take what I knew from, from what worked to go into everywhere else and tell them how to do it. Right. But that, that we've seen that that doesn't work. So if you actually go in from a servant mindset and say, how do I serve my community? What, what resources do I have? What skill set can I maximize to give where I am right now and learn? right? Learn what those things are that we, that we truly need. So like for here, for example, here in the U.S., when COVID hit, I saw people are, were standing in line for five hours to get groceries, right? So how do you, how do you create a food system that is more equitable and accessible? That's an issue. That's a community issue, right? So I must be able to start right where I am in my hometown with my family, with my friends, the people that are suffering in that so that I can learn the true human condition of what's needed so that I can then build something that I can then take to another place and say, okay, culturally, how do you, how do you leverage the learnings into what works for this culture? Because everything, there are always going to be nuances and differences in that. And so when we think about ethics and more morality, you must think about it from the standpoint of building beyond me. I'm not going in to another place just to make a dollar and to set up shop and, and to make some money like that, that is pulling, that is taking, right? But if you're going in and you're, and you're learning how to, how to work with the community and the local resources and, and uplifting what is already working for them, then you're able to take that to every other place in the world. Hmm. Thank you, Lisa. Mike, what's your perspective on this? Uh, two, two perspectives. One is I, I totally agree with what Lisa's saying. Uh, I think a lot of great companies focused on uh, developing a solution to something that is affecting them personally and locally before um, they expanded it to other places around the world. So um, I think if you're it, from a impact entrepreneur perspective, you know, thinking about the problems that are affecting you and your community will probably help you better lead to creating something globally because there are so many common issues we have across the world. Um, my second comment is I think uh, you kind of uh, frame this question as like nationalism versus sort of globalization. And are we done of globalization? Um, and I think even before COVID, we saw signs in the US here and Europe uh, that people want to be more nationalistic 
But I think growing up in the 90s and professionally working since the 1990s when globalization really hit its stride and really uh, a lot of these things like the WTO and all these sort of multilateral activities happened, I, I think these connections are too strong to break. Um, I think we'll be a global society. I think there's a global um, community out there of people who, who don't really have a connection to a country and, and feel like they're part of a, a broader global society. So I think there's too much already momentum on globalization, even though there's both political and COVID hitting that kind of hit, hit sort of the more nationalistic tendencies. But I think it's gonna be, I think globalization's here and will always uh, be a global society, even though there'll always be parts of communities who wanna be more nationalistic regarding that. Global society, that the global citizen, uh, I vote. Can I also have some quick remark on that one, please, if that's please. possible? Yeah. So absolutely. there is this whole idea of globalization. So I, I really feel maybe we're just somehow trying to look at it from a, let's just say, black and white point of view, but that was not what I was mentioning. The whole idea is that, let's just say, even we can just talk about even major brands that whenever they start going to the local market, First, they started learning the local culture. They try to understand the needs of the local mar target market. But then based on that, they try to make sure that first of all, they will work with the supply chain. They try to basically optimize the services. But from the local point of view, that local chapter is going to work in a different capacity than the global part. So companies that they somehow try to, let's just say, uh, at least culturally invade the, the, the local culture and then try to say that, no, you have to from tomorrow work based on my ideology and everything. That's an aggressive mode that I was not mentioning. But the idea that I say that because I have an American company or because I have a Romanian company, everything have to be locally produced and locally made. In so many cases, this is nothing but, a, let's just say, a very uh, let's just say shallow pride. Because if you want to have the best thing given for your own country, you have to make sure you make the best out of everything in the world and then try to distribute it to the local ecosystem rather than try to say that if the same product production or the same pr product is going to be from any other location because it's made by someone else, I cannot use that. So it was somehow, let's just say, bringing things not from a black and white point of view, but rather putting things in the shade of gray. Interesting. Let me ask you this. All three of you are very well connected to the ecosystems. You're very well informed. And actually this question comes from our community. Um, where's the opportunity? Everything's been turned upside down. Things are changing. Some industries are dying, but there's loads of opportunity. Where do you see the opportunity now? We can start the other way. We can start with, uh, we can start with Lisa first. You know, I, I think specific to to this audience, to the techni audience, and we're talking about startups, right? I think there are new ways of receiving funding as you think about starting up your, 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 your company. Um, there are a ton of grants out there where a lot of the monies before, you know, came with, I want an equity stake. And there's been this traditional thought process of, I have to go get VC funding or else I'm not gonna be a good startup, right? Or I'm not gonna be able to be scalable. And the truth is, if you're, if you're first of all, there, there's a couple perspectives. The first that, that I typically take when I coach entrepreneurs is how do you, how do you build by revenue? Like let's, let's take off getting funding, right? And, and think about how do you actually build a sustainable model based on where you are today, right? And then you can then look at those other funding avenues as additions and add-ons to it, but not necessarily your lifeline. Because so traditionally we've looked at VC as I have to, it's a necessary, right? And you end up giving away so much of your company in it, in it you don't, you're not able to, to work in the way that, that you had envisioned and you had hoped for. And so now it's really about if you can identify the need in your community, that you can identify the true need and pain point of your audience in a way that can respond to what's coming next and what they need now, as opposed to what they needed, right? And you're able to pivot, then you're also able to create those revenues in a way that, that will help sustain you and, and, and guide you into those, those right partnerships. Because I call funding, funding relationships partnerships because they're really like marriages. 
And so you must be very mindful of the purpose for which you are taking money and what that money is gonna be used for. So I think there's a completely new world in terms of how we fund our, our ventures. And I think it really starts with the perspective of if I'm able to meet the needs of, of, of my audience, then I can actually be able to make money from that and also pull in other funding sources. It's very interesting you said that. Um, I did uh, um, Sarah Blakesley's masterclass. She's the founder of Spanx. And she said she never got equity funding. She built it all from scratch, a million dollar business. And I was like, that was the first time I, I heard that this is possible, right? So yeah. definitely yeah. opened my eyes. Yeah, interesting. It may not go as fast as you want it but you can build it the way that you, that you want it with the right people if you are patient and, and you're persistent in that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mike, what, what do you think? Where's the opportunity in, in your perspective? I'm, I'm actually a horrible person to ask that question because I'm so data-driven. I'm so driven by what's happened in the past. I, it skews my vision for the future and I, 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 I that's sort of a, a negative I have. So I, I I can't tell any startup or entrepreneur here is where the next big thing is. I'm I'm horrible at that. Um, but all I can say is you, you know overall chaos creates change, and obviously, um, and that's where startups and entrepreneurs thrive. There's going to be so much change currently happening. There's going to be so many cultural things that are going to happening, and I think it, it, you know, and so it's really trying to have deep insights about a theory of what you think is going on and that longer term change after COVID is done and really just diving deep into it on, on, on a, a hypothesis you have and just keep on testing it and trying to drive it because I, I, I you know, I, I could say all the things, you know, things are going to be more tech enabled and things like this, but I doubt people really want to hear those types of things. Um, but to, to Lisa's point, um, I think that's a critical thing. I mean, startups, um, I, I think there's so much noise in media about venture capital. Um, we get lost, like this is the way to grow a startup. And the fact of the matter is only a, a half of a percent of companies really, and, and even in the United States grow that way. And even if you look at fast growing companies measured by like the Inc 5000, which grows the fastest private companies in America, only about 5% of companies growing at 100, 200% per year get venture capital funding. Uh, most companies are not, are looking for alternative forms of funding, um, you know, including, you know, using their personal credit or capital. Um, so, you know, I, I think people, um, when people start their company, I think the biggest thing is to build the company they wanna build, uh, go for the opportunities they believe in, um, look at capital structures that make sense for them. If they are going to be a steady growth company, venture capital probably doesn't make sense for you know 99.5% of companies out there. It's probably more uh, traditional bank capital or, or, or other types of forms of capital or just getting it from initial friends and family. Um, la one last story I'll tell you, I'm writing a book right now based on some very old entrepreneurs over a hundred years old. Um, Henry Ford actually, uh, which is a huge scale up company, um, he got an initial angel investment um, of roughly $150,000 back in maybe 1905, over hundred years ago. Um, he took that, that investment and, and basically uh, returned the investor's money by 3000 X um, and it was all cash flow. He hit product market fit so well, he created a cheap product that the mass market wanted and, and the reason he was able to do that is he, he, was a, he came from a farm community and he understood that farmers wanted a cheap piece of transportation. So you can create a massive company with, without venture capital. It's been done before. Um, we shouldn't be sort of, sort of pushed by the media that this is the only way to build a company um, out there. I wanna say something to that too because one thing that they don't tell you about Henry Ford are the people that he brought in to actually help in the innovations, right? See, this is what it is to truly build a, a like we were talking about a global company, is that you must bring in people from different perspectives. He brought in George Washington Carver, the guy, the peanut guy who created over 300 inventions from just the peanut, including soy, including um, 
forgive me, I forget the, it, some form of um, material that Henry Ford could use to actually build his cars to make them faster and more affordable, right? And so as you think about, you know, these, these, these operators and these entrepreneurs, it's not just about the self, it's about who are you actually building with and, and when you're able to have these different perspectives, you're also able to come up with a lot of different solutions and ideas beyond what's traditionally known about how to build something. Hmm. Cool. Ahmed, what do you think? Where's the opportunity in your eyes? I mean, first of all, just to somehow build something on top of other speakers. Uh, they say if you want to have new ideas, you have to read old books. So it is not such a bad thing to, you know, just give some credit also to what Mike said. And again, another thing, again, just to build up on uh, what other speakers said, uh, be a bit afraid of people who always have the answer right at their hand. Because if you really have some very specific idea, most of the time, if you already have an out of the box answer for that, it is as if like you go to the doctor and they already said, oh, this is your medicine and just come over and take it. You always need to have examination and understand the situation of your startup and what you're really trying to do. So for example, like in a deep tech startup, you always need an investment. While in some other startups, you can basically first try to go and then try to get your market, try to understand it. And based on that, you can rely on selling your product, not the other way around. Because if you really want to work something on nanotechnology and then somebody says that, you know what, just sell it. And then after that, you're going to make money out of that. A, a, a regular nanotechnology operation might need to have 10 years of R&D project that is going to be very expensive products and services that really needs help. And then after 10 years, they can return, let's just say, all the money back. But again, there are other ways to do that. But I would say on the top of my head, one of the things that I have to say, uh, it's uh, Nassim Taleb had this uh, terminology that he could call it the anti-fragile. And that is something that is very important. So the opposite of fragile it is not something that is hard. The opposite of fragile is anti-fragile, meaning that if you have something that if it's being somehow hit is going to break, the opposite of that is something that when you hit it is going to be even stronger. The case of that is, for example, like is the case of airline industry. Every time one airplane falls, the opportunity of the next airline is going to have the same problem is going to drastically go in lower because the airline industry knows exactly how to minimize those risks. The opposite of that is car industry. Every time a car crashes, the next car can crash with the same amount of, uh, let's just say, mistakes and the same amount of possibilities. So if you want to build your industry, it doesn't matter if you want to do something in AI, you want to do something in e-commerce or any other sector, you have to understand how to build a business that every single time a pressure happens, every time that there is unpredictability, it is even going to make your business stronger and better rather than try to put you out of business. Super. Um, this, I have a question from our community again. Um, in your experience of what you've seen, either personally, I know you guys have worked with loads of startups, you've seen a lot. Um, what's the most impressive story of zero to hero, like since we're talking about global impact, um, that you can share with us? It can be from personal experience or it can just be from, you know, the, the public real. We can start with, uh, we can start with Mike this time. Um, uh, probably, the, I mean, someone locally there in Egypt, uh, May Methat from Aventus. I mean, I met May uh, back in uh, April after the revolution. So that's uh, April of 2011. Um, and I was supporting a startup weekend in, in Cairo. Um, and she came in with um, one of our co-founders and they had, it wasn't actually the idea for Aventus, it was a different idea. And to be honest, nobody really had paid attention to May at that point. I think in 2011, we were all sort of interested in sexy ideas and not really to hardworking entrepreneurs. Um, but that, that event helped her think about how events should be managed um, and, and be done and you know, led to her creating Aventus. And she participated in a couple other activities I had in Egypt um, at that point. Um, you know, and then, you know, I, I left Egypt in 2013. Um, and, you know, the next thing I see, I'm in Silicon Valley at um, the Global Entrepreneurship Summit, and there's President Obama and Mark Zuckerberg on the stage. And here comes May Medhat sitting next to those two. 
yeah. um, which which was a shock. I mean, she just persistent. She's an incredibly creative person. Really, just you know, constantly always listening to the market um, place, listening to what the customers wanted. She really iterated on her product a lot, mostly based on product ideas. She probably had to go through some really you know, tough times for about two years to get that going. Got some small investments there in, in by Cairo Angels. Um, but really just a, a really impressive, creative, um, persistent entrepreneur that, you know, was I was happy to play some small part in, in her journey. Yeah, that's fantastic. I've met May and she really is very impressive. And she and her, her co-founder, they actually coded the application themselves and then just went and pitched it, which is just amazing because, you know, so self-made. Um, all right, uh, Lisa, do you wanna go next? And then we'll work our way to Ahmed again. Sure. Um, so there's one entrepreneur that I worked with two years ago and he had a, it was like this small, he, it was a nonprofit and it's the, it was, um, it was to teach kids how to, had a podcast, but learning about identity and being able to speak about who they are, their stories from their perspectives through podcasting and learning that skill. And he originally started as a school program, right? As an after school program. And so he was struggling to understand, well, we're trying to fit within this system. And I said, well, why fit in the system when you can create your own, right? And so we started to look to see how other startups we're, we're able to, to build. And so I'm like, well, let's think about it from the perspective of, of an accelerator. And so as, as, so our relationship ended because he had got, he was in an, an accelerator and he came back a year later and he said, look, let's, let's work together again because here's where I am now. And now he's, now he is creating a production studio with vertical integration. So one of the one of the um, the brilliant businessmen that that we recently lost, Nipsey Hussle. I don't know if, if a lot of folks know about him, but he was um, he was a retreant, but he was from South Central LA and, and a gangbanger. But but his mindset in terms of how to build business was so brilliant because he talked about vertical integration. And vertical integration means owning every part of the supply chain and not having to depend on going to someone else where they call the shots about how you run your business. So for example, from moving from a small after-school program to an accelerator for these high school students to then starting a production studio then allows him to work with radio stations to create internships and to create a pipeline into industry. So now they are teaching, they are not just teaching, right? They're not just implementing within schools, but they're also working with industry and, and looking at different types of partners that can then feed into supporting these, these youth with mentorship. And then these youth are then learning the business to then be fed into, into these jobs, either as engineers, as as editors right because it now it opens up a whole new world and so as i think about what it is to be a successful business venture a zero to to 100 right it's a it's really about expanding your thought process about what it could truly become i like that a lot because i guess it's when you're not married to the idea which is what ahmed was saying as, as well when you're about the mission you're gonna um, find solutions to forward your mission rather than just implement this idea you got into your head. Yeah. There's a thousand pathways to get to that thing. So as long as you have your eye on the end goal and you know for what purpose you're moving toward, you're, you're open to, to new creative solutions and ideas. Because as entrepreneurs, we're creators and innovators, right? Yeah. So that's where you're able to expand that and, and press into that gift. Awesome. Ahmed, you've got 30,000 followers on social media. You, you see so many startups. What's the yeah. zero to hero story? I would say one thing I have to say is um, there was this article that uh, went out about all the depression and everything that is happening in the entrepreneurship world. As a person who is mentoring the startups, at least I would say more than 10 years, 
uh, don't even listen to the one night uh, success stories that even are real because then you only are going to be more and more depressed because unfortunately even when I try to mentor startups I was like always remember that there is a massive factor and that's called luck the timing is very important but even more important than that is luck most of the ideas that you hear they are either happen in the right time or they were just lucky that happened because the operation is a massive deal, but if you're not gonna be lucky enough, if you are not going to be, uh, let's just say, the right time with the right uh, mindsets, you are going to lose. To some extent, Tesla was a loser, not because he was a bad operator, because he was just very much unlucky and he was competing with another guy that, again, I think in 100 years only was, you know, was supposed to be born one of them, but they were, boarding, they were born at the same time and they were competing with each other. So if Tesla was before Edison or if Edison was after Tesla, maybe both of them would have the same success story. So a lot of stories are really happening in this way. But um, talking about podcasts also, so, you know, because, you know, like why not doing 50 things at the same time? So I also started a new podcast called Regenesis. And that's exactly what I do is that I try to bring entrepreneurs that they are basically having this renewing uh, their path. And one of the things that it was very interesting for me is that one of my friends, he was a high frequency trader in New York. And now he has started to uh, do something that is called permaculture, that is a permanent agriculture. So imagine it was even before the pandemic. And now he has something around like 300% profit on his projects. And all he is doing is besides the same being in a stressful ecosystem of high frequency trading, he is just having fun in some places outside of city centers and he grows gardens and he basically it's a fully, let's just say, um, uh, technology oriented uh, business. While the difference is that with the whole pandemic and everything, everybody is getting more and more interested to uh, just say have something with more higher quality. And these uh, gardens are very much sustainable, so they can basically just operate them themselves, so they need more and more uh, let's just say technology in order to make themselves even more profitable. And now imagine that how much an entrepreneur have to have flexibility to run all the way from working for somebody else's companies, making thousands of dollars per month as a high frequency trader to be his own, let's just say, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, boss, but in a totally different ecosystem of, you know, like literally just being, you know, like in the middle of mud and then do something in the garden. So uh, sky is the limit. What's the name do what is your question? Um, the name of the company? Yeah. It's Eden Garden. It's um, uh, so to be honest with you, I'm very sad that I don't remember what Eden is stands for. But if you guys would be interested, whenever you publish the uh, video, I will make sure that I will put this. Uh, uh, let's just say the name of his business there, because to be honest with you, this is always the case that we always have problem with our imagination that if I'm a high frequency trader, I don't have to just get out of my high frequency trading and just be an accountant. It can be whoever you want, as long as you just manage to find your passion. Yes. And I don't think it has to be one thing. Yeah. We, we limit ourselves. Like, again, we are creators and innovators. That same, I, I love how he went from a trader to, to gardening, because it, it's really the same principles just applied in different areas, different ecosystem, different ways, right? Like if you watch children, they're able to do that seamlessly throughout their day and to move that, that's really what it means to be malleable and moldable and to allow things to unfold. Because if you're so focused on it looking a certain way, you miss the scope of the opportunity of all the different ways that you can use one tool. So I love how you, how you said that. That's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sounds, sounds amazing. Um, I just want to ask my team if we still have time for one question. I guess so. We must do. I just have one question again from the community, just a quick one. Um, you want to ask about what is happening tomorrow? <laughs> no. So no I'm either. sorry, I'm, I, I was just disconnected. You can ask me whatever you want, and I'm sorry. Do we still have time for one question? Oh, yes, you actually still have eight minutes to go. <laughs> okay, amazing. So, cause you know, at Techni, we're a big community. We're not one of the biggest communities of startups around the Mediterranean region. So um, I got a lot of questions to ask you guys and this one was on the top of my list, but I left it at the end. But um, since we're talking about building an impactful business, if you're starting a business tomorrow and you were looking to grow, 
to grow to grow big, you know, to have impact, to do something cool. Um, what would be your first hire and why? Who would be? Yeah, what 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 uh, what job title would you hire first and why? You, you can go first. Gonna... There are so many ways you can give the wrong answer to this question. <laughs> can, can I answer, but in a politically correct way, if you don't? Absolutely. Mind. Because it has. It, it you has... Don't answer in politically correct ways. What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah because I'm sorry, because this answer is always going to be wrong. Because we even start answering with the way that if you already have the answer to every question, then that is somehow, you know, like a, a way that. Uh, uh, you know, like you already know that business. So if hypothetically right now what you want to do is from, let's just say health tech, your first hire have to be a doctor that you don't have to just do something outside of the industry. If what you really try to do is something is going to be software oriented, you have to be a software developer. If this is going to be somewhere that you want to sell apples, you have to have a salesperson. If this is going to be somewhere that is going to be related to the golf tech, you have to find some lobbies in order to do that. If you are going to have something that is going to be related to impact startups, you first have to have somebody with years of experience with the nonprofit organizations, because you think that you're doing something impactful while there is a huge international organizations try to tackle that problem, but because it's not an operational problem, but it's rather is an infrastructure and this is, let's just say governments cannot talk to each other, you're going to lose a lot of opportunities. And if you don't mind me not talking about what is going to happen tomorrow, it's going to kill me. Is also is the fact that if the United States is going to get out of the United Nations as a part of basically helping them with their budgets, we're going to have an irreversible problem in our global help with all of the organizations that they try to help people's health issues. So if I want to have an impact for the startups, but then World Health Organization is going to fall apart, then anything that I want to do, I have to first hire one person to make sure that the United States is not going to leave the United Nations, the, United, the WHO, and then everything else I want to do is going to work smoothly. So it's a very multi-layered way that, uh, I'm sorry, but Lisa, you're totally right. If I wanted to be politically cor not correct, that's how I have to basically destroy the question, but I didn't want to do it in the first place. Right, so, startups, sorry. Watching, startups watching, you get it now, like you know what to do. <laughs> Lisa. Lisa, yeah. you, you give us the politically incorrect question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, this isn't this isn't a one way. This isn't a, an, an answer that can really be. It's very specific, right? So the thing that I would say is how to approach, how to look at who your first hire would be, because when you're an entrepreneur, whether you're you're an individual founder, you have co-founders, everybody has their lane and their strengths, right? But they're going to be gaps in, in your business. So for example, with, with me and, and what I'm building right now, I recognize that a big portion of my time is in the financial, like setting up financial systems, setting up um, the administrative piece and, and managing those pieces, right? And so what I've found is after looking at my day to see how my time is spent and looking to see where my strengths are, are best utilized, that is not one of them. Not, that, not to say that that's not my strength, but I realized that I can outsource for that piece that takes away my energy, right? So that I can then focus my attention on the things that I'm great at to maximize that. And also to give opportunity to someone else to help grow them as a leader within the organization. So. It really depends on where you are in your in your growth stage and, and really what you need. So for me, like I do energy audits with my with my entrepreneurs so that you can see where do I spend my time in these different buckets, right, within my life or within my business. How much time do I actually want to spend on that thing? And then do each of those areas give me energy or does it take away energy? And to be able to see it in black and white, you'll, you'll identify those pieces that you need to outsource, right? And those things that you need to refocus and double down on for, for yourself. Right, right. Yeah. Mike, you advise tons of startups, you accelerate them, get them to market. What's your perspective on this? What should be the second hire? Well, I, I mean, I, I agree with Ahmed. This is an impossible question. There's so many dependencies. So I'll actually just answer it as if it was me, you know, being a 50-year-old man 
I, I actually don't want any jerks in my life anymore. So I have a no jerk rule. So I want to be able to work with someone that I know we will get along. I mean, I want someone I can argue with and who will have conflicting opinions in me, uh, but we, that we don't take it personally. So, you know, I think it, I'll have that three hour drive rule that I want to be able to uh, partner with someone that I could be in the same car in for three hours and the time just flies. It just flies because we're just talking and we have so much in common. And, you know, I, I just, because it's a, it's a five to seven year journey, at least probably. And you just want to be able to want to walk into your co-working uh, situation and be able to really, you know, work and communicate. And I want someone different than me. I, I, I this is again, one of my negatives. I've, I've tended to have people that I work with that are kind of like, think just like me because that it's just, you kind of have the same perspective and nobody criticizes what you think. Um, but as I've gotten older, I really, really appreciate people who challenge me, um, even younger people who really just kind of push me more, um, you know, at that point. So, uh, you know, for me, it, it, it'll be less about growing a new big company as you set out that example. It'll be more about, I, I just want a cool and interesting journey where I hope to make some impact with somebody, you know, that I can really connect with uh, really enjoy working with and hopefully together we can you know really do something amazing i mean that's that's what i would look for right now awesome awesome Pedro, do you want me to just maybe uh tweak this question a bit if i can yeah please do so i would say i cannot say exactly who to hire but i can say what could be the two things that you should do and i would say number one would be to listen because I would say listening is the biggest problem with entrepreneurs. Most entrepreneurs, they have this gut delusion. They think they know everything better than everybody else. That's why even when somebody gives them a feedback, they just don't listen. Second, also going back to what also what Mike said, uh, to don't listen to the individuals, but listen to your data later. So gather the data. And then after that, don't be emotional about it. Don't say, because one person said my idea is bad, I'm not going to go after that. See, after you listen to all those people, what your data is exactly uh, bringing back to what you do. And then after that, what is the most important thing in the long run? That again, going back to the conversation also about the VCs, the success rate, it's not relevant at all. How fast you're going to grow in five years is not important. Another factor is also super important is durability. Okay, you're in five years, but how long are you going to stay on the top for five years? Because that's also the second thing. You see a lot of corporations, let's just say MySpace of some sort, at some point they had a very massive growth, but then one Facebook arrived and that was the end of their conversations. There is this funny uh, concept called the startup sabuka. So it's basically a startups go on stage and talk about what can kill them. This would be, make you like, really rethink about half of those ideas because those ideas have a massive impact, but they see that the moment somebody else would do this, then we cannot operate anymore. And those are the factors that we have to understand that in the beginning, we have to ask a question that not only we're going to have high growth, but we managed to stay in business. Can I, can I just suggest a book? Um, a friend of mine wrote a book and it's, it's at least a decade old, if maybe not 15 years. Uh, it's called Small Giants uh, by Bo Burlingham. He's a long time uh, journalist for Inc. Magazine. He actually interviewed Bill Gates and Steve Jobs back when they started off. Um, you don't, and it's really a contrary uh, argument that there's a lot of great companies out there that are not big. There are like you, everybody has their favorite restaurant that just, they, they believe in service. They believe in all the little things. I mean, so I think one of the biggest things I would just like to make the point is, um, you know, don't listen to us, build the company you want to build. Um, you know, and Small Giants really describes people who have passion, incredible passion, as much passion as any of the great entrepreneurs that we hear about the media, but we don't hear about them because their companies are smaller. And there's nothing that is, we can't deem them unsuccessful or any, any, any less smaller than the great entrepreneurs. They are doing something they love, they enjoy, and they're creating value in the marketplace and for their employees. So it's just a book I would highly recommend because um, it just shows a contrary thinking than to a lot of what we see and hear in the media. Awesome. I think we're running out of time. Thank you so much for this very, very insightful, amazing, and super fun panel. 
was a pleasure hosting you, uh, three, Ahmed Piraya, Director uh, at Startup Grand Borso, Lisa Atia, our Strategy and Growth Consultant from TBT Group, LLC from um, LA, and Mike Ducker, Executive Director at Walhalla Global Accelerator uh, from Maryland, just outside of Washington. Thank you so much, and I, I hope to uh, host you again next year. Hi, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for this impressive panel. We really enjoyed it. We all agree that women run the world. Lucky us, we have two moderators with us today. Karim Al-Hakim, Head of Business Development and Investor Relations in Falak Startups, and Karman Nagot, Communication and Business Development Specialist at Falak Startups 2, Nina Walters, Managing Director in Exandiz, Lisa Ateya, Strategy Consultant in TBD Group, Menana Kolyubi, VP, Business Development and Strategy Siemens in Siemens, all got the, gathered up to speak about women in entrepreneurship. Please give them a round of applause. Hi, everyone. I'm Kerima. I'm Karma. And we're here with our friends from Berlin, Los Angeles, and Cairo. Uh, I'm very, very happy and excited to be moderating this panel with Karma. Um, I'm with Anne, uh, Nina. Uh, she's joining us from Berlin. I'm with also Lisa. She's joining us from Los Angeles. And Minan, who's joining us from Cairo. Uh, welcome, ladies. And uh, here we are talking about women and entrepreneurship, um, a panel full of women. And um, this panel actually is aims to tell everyone in this audience what they don't teach you at school. I would kind of disagree because that's also something no one teaches you in life. They don't teach you in the work life about uh, the role of women. Um, we assume a lot of things, for example, um, I, I, I assumed starting um, a career in the, in the tech ecosystem that the biggest exits and the biggest startups, for example, in fintech are led by men. For, and I discovered, for example, that TPA is led by a woman, uh, which had one of the biggest dragon exits in, um, had a dragon exit in, in Egypt. Um, you also think that abroad or in the West, uh, investors are all male, but uh, the most successful and biggest VCs are also led by females. So in a lot of matters, whether it's a positive thing or a negative thing, negative or positive preconceptions, we all need to um, really revisit some of these uh, concepts. I will leave Karma to perhaps tap into our first topic, uh, talking about the gap between male and female. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to see you. And all of you have different experiences with startups and founders. So I just wanted to start by talking about what you think are some of the biggest obstacles that female founders face. Uh, in comparison to their male counterparts. We can start with Mena, yeah. Menan, sorry, uh, who is uh, actually coming from that tech background and we would love to see uh, you tap into the tech side of mentorship uh, to women in startups. Definitely, uh, thank you very much, uh, Karma and, uh, and Karima for this uh, introduction. And I think it's very exciting every time we talk about the role of women and for me, very inspiring because I think uh, I've always been inspired by women um, you know, role models uh, growing up. And I think the impact and the potential of women is sometimes underestimated. But um, from what I've seen growing up, I've, uh, it, it, it exceeded my expectations. Um, and, and a lot of barriers, if I can say, melt uh, in front of women compared to uh, the same thing, same barriers for men. No offense, uh, men at all, but uh, I've seen the power of women uh, come up. So giving an example, uh, like uh, from where I see it, uh, I mentor startups in tech and non-tech, uh, um, uh, let's say back, uh, backgrounds or, or fields. And uh, specifically in Egypt, what I've seen is a lot of, I'm, I've been really inspired by the stories uh, I've seen and, and success. And uh, I think Egyptian women, um, one of the barriers that they face sometimes is the location where they are. Um, so if, if they're not based in Cairo, it's sometimes, um, a, let's say it's, it's, it's a challenge to come to Cairo. I mean, I've seen um, uh, uh, female founders come from outside of Cairo, even from Luxor and uh, uh, even social entrepreneurs, uh, uh, women. And, and it's, it's very inspiring to see them really um, come all the way to Cairo to see that, but not having an ecosystem e evenly distributed between the cities is one of the gaps because for men, sometimes it's easier to 
uh, move around and stay wherever they want, even if they're not based in Cairo, but for women sometimes, especially if they're married women or depending on their age and their family and how conservative, conservative they may be, um, this is also one, one of the challenges that they might face. Um, another challenge uh, could be uh, the language, but I think this also, uh, speaking English or not, depending on if it's a female or a male, I, I don't have statistics in mind, but this also some, sometimes having access to the, um, let's say, global ecosystem and the platforms online, which are in English sometimes, uh, are one of the common barriers. But I don't know if it's more for women or men, it's, at the end it's an educational system uh, thing. Um, but I've seen startups win competitions, uh, even on a regional level, um, until even before Corona, I, I, the, the COVID uh, phase, um, from outside of Cairo. And um, they were even invited to go to UAE in one of the, the competitions where I was a jury. And I was, uh, I was really impressed by, by the impact and the social impact, let's say, but that, that such startups uh, led by female, uh, females, you know, entrepreneurs. Uh, can have. So I think this is on top of my mind, the barriers I've thought of, but. Yeah. Yeah. And I think maybe Lisa and Nina, you know, we can also discuss like your angle because you're more from, you know, a, a Western uh, perspective, but just to give an idea of like the, one of the biggest gaps that we have regionally. So we have a huge gap for funding for women in Africa. Uh, they've estimated it to be like $42 billion worth of uh, funding gap for women in Africa. And so I think other than, you know, the cultural issues that we have uh, regionally of how, you know, obviously movement, being able to go from more rural parts of Egypt to more uh, cosmopolitan parts of Egypt where there may, may be access to funding, whether through VCs or even like uh, development banks, uh, we have a, a huge funding issue generally in the continent. And so maybe... Uh, Nina and Lisa, if you guys want to discuss a bit more about uh, yeah. what's happening on if your it's something end. also that you'd see in, in the Western um, ecosystems, that funding gap. Yeah. Nina, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, that's completely true. Um, in the last year, according to Crunchbase, female and female-only founded teams got only 3% of all of the capital worldwide which is insane. Um, and it's absolutely the same thing here um, in Europe. Um, probably maybe a little bit less, but it's still very heavily skewed towards uh, men and straight white men, to be straight with you. Um, so one of the things that a lot of investors look for when they're deciding who to invest in is, is the team, particularly in the early stages. And obviously, once you've got the first amount of funding, it's much easier to get, get more. Um, people look for people like them a lot of the time and they use statistics to look at the most successful companies and try and emulate those teams but because historically as the money has gone to these male dominated teams that's sort of repeating itself um, which can then lead to this sort of spiral and sort of self-fulfilling prop prophecy of it happening um, continuously. We are now seeing that change slowly but there is for sure a shift we're seeing um more female led vcs we're seeing more um more female focused funds um which is making a big difference because that money is already earmarked for the women and female led companies to start with which makes a huge difference um we're also seeing more more, more female founders now becoming investors most investors were formerly startup founders who have done well and then, you know, either become angels or gone more into the VC route. Um, and so now that more women are becoming more successful, we're seeing more, again, more women then investing, which means it's easier also then for women to get more, um, let's uh, not screen time, but uh, cash, cash time, get a little bit more cash. Um, yeah. But if you look at the statistics, um, those that have women on a managing team somewhere in the sea level are statistically, statistically outperform and are more profitable than all male teams. So it's actually in VC's interests to, to invest in women or mixed teams. And this is something that, um, at least in Europe, they're trying to promote a lot. Uh, when I founded my first startup in 2013, I was told to get a male co-founder to get funding. And I was actively told that by, by an investor. And uh, that absolutely did not happen. That was never gonna happen. I mean, if, if I had a male co-founder, fine, but I was not going to get a male co-founder in order to take their money. I don't want their money if that's the game. 
Yeah. Um, and this is still advice that is given today, purely from playing the statistics. And those are the numbers that we, we need to change. And they are changing, but, but slowly. But well, honestly, the, you get a comment like this from your investor, you don't want it, you don't want him to be on your cap table anyways. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> just had to say it out there. Uh, what about you, Lisa? Do you have any, um, from your perspective, I know that you worked a lot uh, with demographics that have been uh, not represented uh, with either people of color or now working uh, with the female cause. So how can you tell us about what's happening in the States? Is it the same trend that we're talking about? And we can actually say this is not just um, statistics from uh, Africa or the MENA region, but also it's a global phenomenon that has been observed. Yes, 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 absolutely. And, and everything that, that Nina said was absolutely right on target. Um, that's very much a global perspective. Um, so from, from my perspective, right, I, I'm, an, I'm an American Egyptian woman, Egyptian American woman, right? And I grew up in the U.S., but from an Egyptian perspective, right? And so it came with those same cultural values. And so there's always this split. It's almost like a split identity thing, right? And I'm saying that in terms of perspective and how we see women, because we are raised to be strong and educated, right? And and to go after these opportunities, but only so much as it makes our male counterparts comfortable, right? And so the woman is, is in usually in a position of power, even though it may not seem like that outwardly, right? Like the woman, even in Egypt, when I was there 10 years ago, you know, like we, we have a certain when behind closed doors, women are the ones that run the house, they do the tutoring, they, they, they are managing everything. So it's almost like running a startup. It doesn't matter whether you're indoors or outdoors, you're running, you're running a business, right? And so from an early age, we're taught that it can only look one certain way. And so the perspective in a lot of different cultures around the world is women can only fit one role. So when you start seeing women going into boardrooms and, and doing funding, uh, pitching for funding, then all of a sudden it's like, wait, how, how did you get into the room, right? But then when they actually start, yeah, I'm sorry? Well, we're not in the kitchen. Yeah, exactly. So, but, but the beautiful thing about it is women are able to see problems from a multi perspective, right? Because they see how it affects everybody in every part of their community, right? Not just them. So when you build business and you go to find funding, these women have multiple perspectives and are able to, to, to show how that money is able to be used in multiple different ways. And they've often done a lot more with a lot fewer resources because they've had to just like a lot of people of color like you have to be really scrappy yeah 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 you uh, you bootstrap and so by the time you get in front of a traditional investor they're like well you know just like nina was saying do you do you have a male counterpart why i've already done everything that that person is is purposed to do in the business and so when we think about it from, from a global perspective and what I'm seeing even in the US, there are also alternate ways of getting funding because there, there are people beyond just the VCs that, are, that have more foresight and more forethought in terms of giving money, giving money, right? Or investing in women founders or people of color. So like private foundations, high net worth individuals, they're not necessarily looking at the ROI, even though the ROI in terms of like revenue, they're looking between, you know, they, they say they want a 10% return on their money. Typically it's a 3% return or a three, time, three times their return, right? But what happens when you actually work with the right partners to give you these funds? So private foundations actually are able to be a lot less restrictive in terms of the founder has to look like this, they have to have this amount of revenue, they have to, you know, all of these um, pillars that you have had, or these milestones that you would have had to hit already, right? Like these, these foundations are now saying, okay, let us look at these folks that may not have the background of having started startups, right? But they have the grit, right? They have like, they have the integrity, 
they have the the strength they have the the strategy they have the the vision right and they're the kind of person again like nina was saying right that i would want that person to to run this company because at the end of the day the business is going to change multiple times over it's going to shift and, and vary in the way that you approach the end goal but the person is really who who you invest in and so what's happening now is that there's a lot of vc funds there's private foundations there's these high net worth individuals that are coming together and saying e even especially during COVID, right there's been a lot of these grant funds that have come up and popped up especially for women entrepreneurs um, even like Melinda Gates, she, she set out a $100 million fund and is giving $10 million to 10 entrepreneurs, right, over five years. And they're all women. It's focused on women, right, because they realize that now more than ever, women are able to see how all of these aspects of our work are, are connected, right, and how they affect every other part of global economics, social, you know, like, social outcomes, all of the pieces that, all of the structures and systems that are collapsing as we know it, right? They're like, women are now gonna be the new builders. So let us set up those, those foundations to, to say, okay, let's invest in people that don't look like the traditional founder. Yeah. You really yeah. reminded me of something actually that I've, that I've seen a lot and I remember writing about, um, is that the real difference when it comes to funding with men and women is that men are funded based on potential, women are funded based on performance. That's so true. if you're looking, if you've got two pitches back to back, the, the ma male pitch is typically saying, oh, we're gonna be three billion in four years and we're gonna, we are going to do X, Y, Z. It's all very future oriented yeah. and vision oriented. Um, whereas if you look at um, the, the female founders, they normally say, yeah, screw that. We've done it already. We have this, we have this revenue. We have so many customers we have. Yeah. So they've already shown that they have the chops and that they have the strength and the power to build what they want to build. Which seems to um, be a very big problem, like a very big gap between like VC investors who are men who seem to be very engaged with male founders who are like, we're going to be a billion dollar company versus the female founder who's like, Okay, today we're a hundred employee company and this is what we're doing, which is really honing in on the core of the business versus, you know, anybody can say. And you're no, no longer allowed to be ambitious. If you're ambitious or give that aura of being ambitious, you're a social climber, kind of a irrational, you know, are you crazy? You want to be a billion dollar company? You'll never call, yeah, women like, are expected to tame either their expectations of success or try to tame other people's expectation of success towards their own. So it's it's just you're if you're gonna be firm, you're bossy. If you're gonna be ambitious, you're crazy. Um, yeah. So I don't know if any of you, I, I I hear I see a lot of nods, but like if you guys know of any specific uh, examples, because here we're talking about your uh, personal um, experiences as well. Since I think Lisa also tapped into that fact that people. Um, people lead the business so the business is the people leading it so if you have any uh, specific examples of other entrepreneurs or yourselves that you faced um, that also follow into that uh, I think from where I see it I'm not an entrepreneur but I am fascinated by that and um, yeah but from where I've seen I mean from my personal experience I've seen sometimes in some cases uh, especially men not easily encouraging women uh, really taking leadership positions in some cases. This is a cultural thing. Um, it's the competition. You know, men are very competitive. Uh, women are competitive, but not to the same extent as men are. And so, I mean, it's, we're not driven by being competitive. We're, at least from where I've seen it, we're driven by the impact we can, you know, have. I think there's a lot of empathy, more empathy that women have than men. And one of the, the key leadership, um, let's say, skills that are is actually required is, is empathy, uh, according to even McKinsey and, uh, and other consulting companies. And since men, I don't want to say lack empathy, but are not leaders in that area, sometimes women can achieve more using the skill that is not innate to that to men. And uh, women, 
have to face and I've had to face at some point in my, my career some comments, um, not from my management, but from peers, uh, you know, whenever I assumed a, a more senior position. And, and I think in, in the, from the female founders I've, I've met, uh, whether in social entrepreneurship or, uh, or uh, non-social entrepreneurship, um, women are really driven, you know, when, whenever you have a challenge, even, even if you're of color or if you're of, of a different ethnicity or, you know, different background, whenever you feel, I don't want to say oppressed, but you have challenges, you tend to really give your maximum compared to other people who don't have the same challenges. And that's why women have succeeded from my perspective, at least in Egypt, uh, to out or surpass what men, um, their peers uh, in, in uh, entrepreneurship or in startups, because they really have a lot of challenges, but they are more motivated to really prove, you know, you're always there, you want to prove you're better, you're better, you're better, and you deserve this. And, and that's why I like what, what Nina also just mentioned in terms of women have already performance a track record compared to men who are always in the future, we'll do this and this and that to try to wow the investors or whoever they're pitching to. Um, but yeah, and I love what the Lisa, the comparison you did with the kitchen and all that. Really, women are management, like they're Ooh. multitasking. They're man I mean, I related to what you said and it's, it's true. You know, you, they manage so many things uh, and, and uh, they've done so many experiments about women and how women can multitask compared to, uh, to men. If you've seen, you know, the picking a phone call and typing and scanning and all that, we're all familiar with this example. So I've seen it at work and I've seen that in startups and females. And, uh, you know, I've seen, you know, female founders, she's pregnant in the ninth, uh, ninth months and she's still working and doing things that other men would not necessarily be able to do. So if you have a woman who's a female founder and she's pregnant and almost, you know, really at the, you know, at the end of the cycle and of, of, of a pregnancy and she's that committed, I think this also gives a message to, yeah. to investors in general and inspires. Um, yeah. yeah. I think you have to be really careful about the multitasking aspect though, because we can do it. And how many times, even if you're in a group of C-levels, let's say you're probably the only female in, within a group of three or four founders, right? Um, who is it that's being expected to take the notes of that meeting? So who is it that is um, organizing the events? Who is it that is doing all the little office-y things? Um, so even if the, the people that you're working with are very um, open-minded, I don't say open-minded, but um, they're a big believer in feminism and pro women and they believe that you can do it and they think you're a great entrepreneur in your own right you still might find yourself slowly doing some of these smaller little more traditionally admin or organizational management type type roles um, that are more traditionally associated with women so that's something that is um, always worth just looking out for and then saying at the start yeah sure I'll take the notes you take them next time and let's rotate so, you know, setting expectations like that in advance is something that um, is a really great thing to do. I don't know if we're giving action tips today, but there you go. That's, a, that's what we're going to get anyway. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask you all if, you know, uh, you had some, some tips or advice that you would give women. And I know, Lisa, I think you also were kind of picking up on you know, marginalized communities and how, you know, empathy creates really strong entrepreneurs. And I think female entrepreneurs, because they do face several obstacles, whether cultural or fiscal or generally like having, you know, this workplace uh, environment that might be a bit different than their male counterparts and having to say, you know, you take the notes now and I'll take the notes later. So just like uh, Whitney, who founded Bumble, she, yeah. she left Tinder because it was a bro culture and she was one of the co-founders of her own company. So it's, it's kind of, you can even be the boss and, and, and be dragged out of your leadership position just because the, the, the layers of managers under you or employees under you are having that bro culture that's gonna end up uh, being toxic for your own um, self. Yeah, Lisa, I'd love to hear what you think about all of this. Yeah. So it's interesting because there, there's a couple different perspectives and I also want to, to respond to the other two ladies because you guys both brought up really, really great points. So first of all, you know, when you, when you start a company as a woman, you must be very mindful of whom you are starting this with, right? You must know without a doubt, what is your purpose? Why are you doing this? Is it for the dollar? If that's, if that's it, it's not gonna, it's not gonna go anywhere. You must have a purpose and a why that's bigger than yourself. 
Like you must be willing to understand and, and go deep enough to know like, why am I even building this? Okay, maybe I'm building it because it solves a problem that I've had, right? For my, for my life, but how does that impact everybody else beyond me? So that my, the, the business that I build can be sustainable and scalable without me, right? And so when you choose the partners that you work with, whether co-founders or funders or other like partnerships, right? That you use to kind of outsource to build out and scale, you must, you must be mindful of that they're going the right, the same, same direction that you are and that they have the same intention and purpose. Because someone may say that, but they may only say that to get your dollar because they see the potential of where you're actually going and they see how incredibly smart and strategic you are, right? And a lot of people will want to ride those coattails. So you must be mindful of that. The other thing about it is to what the other ladies were saying, you know, as a woman, you are a community builder, right? As a, as a male founder, typically you are of self and that's the individual. That's the Western way that we've been taught, right? Self, self, self. I can do this by myself. I, you know, and that's that bro culture, right? Like everybody's in it for themselves. What can we get? Give me equity. I want this. I want a pool table and lunch every day. Right. But that's, that's true. That's Silicon Valley. Sure. At, 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 at it's, at it's, but it's, it's a so part of culture. It's, this is a That's huge exactly part of it. it. Yes, like beer in the middle of the workday. Seriously, they do this. Beer on tap. I've seen it, right? And so you lose, you lose the purpose for what you're going for and what you're striving for. And so when women typically build companies, and I and I don't even like say marginalized communities. I, it's those. It's people that are just not seen as equal right? You can be black, brown, yellow, purple. It doesn't matter. You can be a woman or a man. Do we see one another as equals? And if we are not respected as equals, then that's where that, that imbalance comes in. And so as women, we have learned, yes, to multitask, but we've also learned how to use all the resources that we have around us to outsource and maximize what, what we need to do. So if I know that I'm not good at admin, I'm gonna give someone, whether I go to the college and I learn how to use my resources and tap into those free resources, right? Cause it's not always about having to pay for that, but how do I help build other leaders around me so that when I'm not here, I know that they can, they can take the ropes and that, that, cause that's really what you're doing. When you build a company to scale and to be sustainable, again, you're building it beyond you you cannot be the center of it or else it's not sustainable. It's just a small business. And that's usually what, what keeps people in that self mindset is it's got, I, I gotta be my own brand. I have to build it with what I want it and how I want it to go. No, like, again, there are a thousand ways to get to the goal, but if you build a team around you and you've learned how to, how to maximize the resources that you have by outsourcing to the right people while also learning how to build leaders, that company is going to last generations beyond you as long as your purpose is set in the right direction as is everybody else's. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you. And since we said, and I think you had said it before, um, the business is led by that person or that person, we can all agree that women are, they have yeah, on a global scale, very similar traits. And the question that we'd love to ask you guys, what does a successful or just a normal female entrepreneur look like or has, what are the traits? So we understand that women have more empathy. Uh, they tend to be more emotionally yeah, purposeful and emotionally intelligent. Um, they also are team players. They're usually attracted to the social roles so as leaders they they're closer to their employees in general uh, and sometimes they are asked to be tamed or they have to play the front where they need to be a little bit more firm um, they need to take that stand on and, and and be extra not nice just to make sure they're not seen as weak um, so from your experience from working with uh, female leaders either with you uh, men and who worked with a lot of female entrepreneurs do you see a pattern? Do you see um, a trait or an avatar we can create to, to uh, yeah, 
to harm, for example. Yeah, I think you summarized, uh, of course, the key elements. Yeah, definitely, any empathy, purpose, impact. Um, there are innate feature in women, features in women that sometimes men tend to let's say, um, comment on and discourage women from having that. So I think my, one of the traits uh, I would uh, think are very important for female founders and entrepreneurs to, uh, is actually to be uh, really um, uh, not shy and let's say to be confident. Um, I think the self-confidence is something we uh, sometimes culturally and sometimes because of uh, family and et cetera and, and uh, selflessness, you know, the ex excessive selflessness of women, uh, we tend to forget, you know, ourselves from the equation and uh, uh, give more weight to other people's opinions about, about us and about what, what we should do, what's right and wrong. So I think really being assertive, this is one of the traits that uh, could help uh, really because innovation comes from really getting out of your comfort zone, having a lot of empathy, starting from uh, really the pains and to really feel the pain of your users or and customers uh, really need to have empathy. And if, you, if someone tells you you're emotional, and I've heard that a lot, you know, um, whether it's in corporate or in startups environment, sometimes by men is, is, you know, you're really emotional or women are emotional. And there's this stereotype that, you know, emotional is something like bad thing, being in touch or in, 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 in touch with your emotions or, the, the uh, society, you know, your end users' emotions. And actually this turned out to be something, whenever, when I heard about empathy a few years ago and I, I was like, why didn't I, why didn't I know about empathy to really um, respond to all these uh, claims that I'm emotional or that women are emotional? So I think a very important thing is to really uh, train yourself uh, for, if I'm talking to a female founder, is to really be assertive, um, not let yourself be bullied. I would say bullied because bullying is not just in school, but it's also in the, uh, core, you know, uh, the business world uh, by men sometimes. Uh, older men with gray hair, etc. You know, gray hair of, has its value, of course, but sometimes um, we give more importance to um, experienced people and sometimes tend to overwrite our own opinions about ourselves as women. And um, so, not to being being emotional, of course, not being easily influenced by others. Uh, uh, and all that. So I think this is important. In addition to empathy, really capitalizing on this uh, and uh, and purpose. I love what you said, Lisa, about purpose. I mean, whenever I w w uh, when I started thinking about my own purpose, it really changed my life and how um, uh, and my motivation. And and I've seen, um, I would say, all of the female founders I've mentored or interacted with are really driven by um, by purpose and an impact. And there's this. It's connected to really solving real pain, and uh, and I think this is something con staying connected with that purpose, building on up on what Lisa said, really is is one of the key success factors. Not to forget or lose focus of of that purpose, because if, if you're driven by purpose and your startup is driven by purpose, you inspire others, and you really um, you're always in connection and connected to the real pain and um, um, let's say goal you want to reach actually by by addressing this pain. So I think this is. Um, Two of the things I, I, or a few points I would um, summarize in addition to what was said. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. I don't know if Nina has anything to add from seeing different uh, women led startups scaling up. And you actually mentioned something before uh, we speak. Um, you said that you haven't seen a lot of scale ups led by women. And perhaps these women or, or these scale ups need a specific trait that the women you've worked with did not have? Not so much. I think um, one thing actually I want to pull actually on a lot of different threads that we've had going on in this call. Um, Lisa talked about the difference between a small business and a startup. And a lot of women lead small businesses rather than startups. And I just want to say also that is totally okay. Um, I'm, I mean, I own an agency. I'm a consultant. I, I have a small team. I am a small business owner. I don't I, I'm not a startup, right? And that's totally okay if that's the right uh, approach for you. Um, and so I see more people in that way. Uh, also because the companies I work with are normally at a later stage of funding. So we're going back to that funding gap. So it's a numbers game. Uh, but in terms of the qualities that I have seen in female founders, because I have of course worked with, with quite a few over the years, um, in addition to everything that Menon has already said, um, I would say a quiet fierceness because they need this resilience. Um, yes, they outwardly, they're showing their empathy, they're 
networkers, they're, you know, introducing other people rather than networking for themselves. They have all these sort of more, let's, I don't want to say softer qualities, but they absolutely have their eye on the prize. They have absolute nerves of steel because they've had to, to get to where they are in the first place. Um, because they still have to operate within a system that in many ways doesn't benefit them and, and can be at times against them. Um, depending on, on where you are in your industry. If you're in, I mean, the social space and social impact, you probably see a lot more women um, entrepreneurs than you do in deep tech AI, for example, for all sorts of reasons. Um, but every founder, female founder, no matter where they are, has a real sort of, I, I like the phrase quiet fierceness. I think that's true. Um, they know exactly where they are, where they're going, where they're at. They're not going to get there by yelling the same way that some other uh, male founders would do. And I think that's super cool. Um, I also just want to add one thing on to what men said about the bullying point. Not just men. Not just men. Um, the higher that you go, I mean, this also adds into what, what um, the lovely moderator Kareem and Kim was, Kim was saying earlier about being nice or being a bitch, right? And then your, and your competence based on that. You can be nice, but then you're probably not competent. If you're competent, you're probably seen as a bit too forceful or there are negative things. And as you go further up the ladder in a job before you start a company, there are fewer and fewer women and it gets more and more competitive. If there's um, two openings and there are four people going for the job and two of them are women, as a woman, you tend to automatically think that a maximum of one of them will go to you. There's no way that both women will be promoted. Statistically, that might be true, but it leads to, um, at least this is something I saw in myself and it's something that I now mentally work against. Um, I see this com competition because you want to achieve and you want to get there. And then there comes a point when you're like, actually, no, it doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, it can be fine for everybody and to then, you know, build these communities. But I think that because of the conditioning that we've had to be a little bit more adversarial to fight for where you've got to, you have to remember sometimes just to take a step back and be like, actually, no, we are all on the same team. We're all heading in the right place. So I think the community building aspect that Lisa mentioned is super important, but I think that sometimes you need to, some people need to remember that. Um, I certainly did. I was not always a community builder. Um, I was more competitive, but I've learned over the years that that's not going to get me as far. Um, and that, that's something that I've learned. And I think that's a mistake that um, other people can, can learn from without needing to do it themselves. Yeah, I went off topic from the question, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. You know what's funny though? That right there is that quality. So to what Menon and what, what you just said, Nina, it, it's that honesty, right? And not being ashamed not feeling guilty for, for coming to those realizations and being able to speak it out. See, what, what, what you both have been talking about is ownership, right? The assertiveness, the, the, the owning your emotions. I may, be, I may feel my emotions, but I'm not led by them because I'm very clear about what we need to do and why we're doing it. I'm being strategic. I'm not being emotional, right? And so when you can actually speak out and face what's coming up against you. That's ownership of yourself, of your walk. And the truth is the women that are able to stand in that, because it's not easy, right? You have come to some moment in your life that has shifted you into this place of belief and faith beyond what you can see right now, right? And, and, and so often, right, our whole lives are, are, are taken over, not taken over, but it, at least for me, right? I've seen, especially in cultures where religion is a big part of it, you can't separate faith from, from work and business. And we try so hard to, to be Western in that you separate and you divide. You can't divide yourself, right? Yeah. And so the women that I see that are successful, even if it's not by dollars at first, right? Are those ones who have a faith to have a vision beyond what they can understand, what even maybe they can even tell other people about at first, right? And that's when people call them crazy. That's, oh, you're, you're too assertive. No, I know where I'm going. Yeah. If you believe in me, the way that I know where I'm going, follow me because where I'm going, it's not for me. It's for all of us.
right? And that's that community because then when you're in that, that mindset, you're willing to, to, to show your, your weaknesses and those weaknesses then become your strengths because now you're teaching everybody else around you how to own their own stuff, good or bad, right? And in everything that you're able to, to own, especially in people that you're managing, like, that, that shows that fierceness of you're not afraid of what people have to say about you because you know who you are and you know what you stand for and you know which way you're going. So it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Like all scriptures across all religions have said, when you go with me, you go against the world. Yeah. And so you must walk boldly in that and humbly in that. It's not about, I know what's right. No, oftentimes women who walk in faith are walking with, there is something bigger and greater leading me. And so I'm walking in the truth. Whether I understand it or not, whether you understand it or not, we are gonna walk, we are gonna walk boldly in that. And, and that's that ownership. That, that's what it is to truly stand in, in who you are as a woman founder. And, and that's why women founders often are able to, to get so much more done and accomplished because they believe. I want to add on what you both just said is really the strength of women in general, um, especially female founders, really is driven from their faith and their purpose. And this is where actually the purpose can really strengthen your, like make you more resilient and really in the, even the toughest situations. Uh, and, and I love what you said, Nina, as well about resilience, really uh, being resilient, cultivating uh, resilience, being self-aware and all that, and really always remembering your purpose and why you started this in the first place this is really what makes you really in front of you know so many bullying or anything really remain strong standing and still as assertive as you could be so and reach your your full potential and don't let anyone um you know make you slower or uh, or divert your attention you know so this is uh i love what you just said about that it's, it's inspiring even for me now you know just to uh, hear that yeah absolutely anyways i think we can obviously since women are very talkative and can go on for hours. We can definitely uh, continue this conversation for another like good hour. Um, but just, just out of curiosity, and this is like, this is where I'm gonna wrap up before uh, the technique team tells me to like get out. Um, how many people like from a gender uh, proportion, do you think we're gonna get the attention as this panel, like online panel from, I think our audience is gonna be mainly female. And we're actually still going to be talking to ourselves and also trying to convince ourselves that women in entrepreneurship have a bigger role. That's my opinion. Do you guys agree that our audience that will tune in either online or by just uh, their interesting, um, them being interesting in starring our panel would be mainly women or mix of both or maybe mainly men because the techni attendees might be more male than female but what do you guys think you know last year i was at techni and i did a panel and it was called the power of a woman entrepreneur right and there was one male in that audience and and he was more empathetic and was more interested than even a few of the women that were there. So I think it's all about intention, right? And, and the truth is like, whomever this is supposed to be for, they will hear it. Whomever is supposed to see this, they'll see it. And they'll get what they need because everybody is, is in a different place in their journey. And so they'll take what they need. But I, I truly believe that whomever this is purpose for, it, it'll, it'll get there. It'll get to them. We'll get to their hearts. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you very, very much, uh, Nina, Lisa, Minen, and um, Minen, I'm sorry, uh, just wrapping up and, and, and thanking everyone for tuning in. Um, I hope everyone's safe and I hope we pursue this uh, further and perhaps stay in touch, all of us together, um, and uh, see how we can empower more women, more youth. Yeah or just entrepreneurs, because we still don't discriminate, although we, we talk praises about women, <laughs> we still <laughs> like everyone. Um, and yeah, thank you very much uh, for, for being there. Thank you thank guys, you. It was so nice meeting everyone. That was very fruitful. Thank you all very much. Creating a powerful team might be an obstacle to some businesses, but with Karim Samra, 
founder of Change Labs, I think it won't be anymore. Please welcome Karim Samra. Hello, everybody. My name is Karim Samra. I'm the founder at Change Labs, and it's really a pleasure to be here today with you at the Techni Summit in Alexandria to talk about what I believe is the next trillion dollar opportunity that most of us aren't even aware of. So I'm gonna to start today uh, with talking a little bit about my background and how I got here. And I'm gonna build up the suspense until I get to the next uh, topic, which is the next trillion dollar opportunity. And then I will give you some tips because I wasn't able to attend in person this year, unfortunately, and I'm so sorry about that. We may not be able to have a live Q&A, but certainly I will share my contact information with all of you after the session, and you can feel free to uh, reach out to me. So let's get started. Uh, let me talk first about you know, my, my, my pathway. So the, the, the title that I have here is, you have to get comfortable fast with taking the road less traveled. And there have been a number of defining moments in my career and in my uh, journey that I wanted to mention here in case it's useful for all of you listening. Uh, the number one thing I did, which was defining, is I chose to study history. And most of you are probably wondering why I did that. You know, it was just what I was interested in. It's what I chose. It was against the will of my parents. My parents were not happy. My dad is a doctor. We're Egyptian originally. So, you know, you can you know already what that means. But I did choose history uh, right away at a young age uh, against the grain. The second thing I did, with it, which I think was a defining moment, is after graduating from college and, and getting a job at a major technology firm, okay, EMC Squared at the time, some of you may be familiar with it, um, you know, I found myself in a cubicle with hundreds of other people just like me. It was a, it was a really big, huge room in Boston, right? EMC Squared is headquartered in Hopkinton, Massachusetts. And I sat there one day um, wondering to myself, what am I doing here? Why am I in a cubicle with dozens of other people? Uh, the work I was doing was not exciting. It was boring. Yes, I was learning, but I just couldn't stand it. And so one day I literally stood up and walked out the door and never came back. Now, I'm not recommending this <laughs> as, a, as an exit strategy. There are better ways to exit, but that's what I did. I quit the cubicle and I quit it in a very uh, sudden and immediate way. I couldn't handle it. And I decided eventually to go back to school. And I, I went to New York and I, and I went to get my, my MBA from NYU Stern, uh, which was a great uh, decision, of course. But I want to let you know that it was a personal decision that took me to New York to do my MBA. It wasn't, you know, of course, it's, it's a top 10 school. I was a merit-based scholarship recipient, but I made a personal decision, uh, you know, because I wanted to be near someone in New York. I, I made a personal decision to go back there. Yet it proved to be a very valuable decision. And so sometimes, you know, I, I found that when you follow your heart, even if it's the low, road less traveled, you follow your heart and you let your heart guide you when making decisions, uh, that can actually work. Uh, after New York City, I moved back to Egypt. Okay, for the first time in my life, I was raised abroad my whole life. For the first time in my life, I moved back to Egypt. That was a defining decision, you know, working with uh, in, in Egypt uh, with Egyptians for the first time with Booz and Company advising the Minister of Finance at the time, uh, you know, working on really strategic deals for our country and for my country uh, made me appreciate the value of that, something I had never experienced before. And yet, you know, I still did move back to New York City after that, uh, you know, did consulting, I did uh, banking, I worked on Wall Street. You know, I found myself again, though, after a number of years, having moved back to New York City, back in a cubicle. Now, it was a fancier cubicle, it was a better paid cubicle, uh, you know, it was more, it was a much more prestigious cubicle on a much more expensive street, but it was still a cubicle. And so I reached the stage again, you know, and again, this was a defining moment in my life. Number two or, or number four here, according to the list, I quit again, the cubicle. And this time I quit it and I chose a completely different career, a career in impact. So a social enterprise impact. Uh, so working with companies and startups and, and a foundation that supports young entrepreneurs trying to launch their impact centered startups, trying to change the world. And at the time I, when I quit the cubicle the second time, I joined a company called The Hope Prize and, uh, and I chose impact effectively. And then the last defining moment I think after that was, was you know, once I've joined The Hope Prize, gained all the experience, I ended up uh, quitting that too, not quitting in a bad way, quitting in a good way and founding Change Labs, and then eventually doubling down on Change Labs. So that's sort of the quick uh, history, my history very quickly. Um, 
I think one of the things we all have to appreciate is that in this sector, in the, in the, in the impact sector, uh, in the social enterprise sectors, in the startups and entrepreneurship sector, like in any other, expertise and experience is very valuable and not many people have it. And so you have to find a way to build that expertise over time uh, and then before you can actually start really operating properly in this industry. And what you build, of course, as an entrepreneur grows slowly in the beginning and then in bursts later on, but you have to listen to the market and you have to believe in what you're building and understand that what you're building is important and valuable to you and it has to be meaningful, but you also have to understand how much chance ends up playing a role. You know, after founding, after, after I left uh, my, my previous employer and, and, and joined so, and found the Change Labs, you know, um, you know, I got recruited by my previous employer and my previous employer asked me to, to not do this, to come back in. They offered me more money. They offered me more, you know, to be in a better location. They offered me a lot of enticing things, but I was willing to double down on Change Labs. And they told me to shut down Change Labs. They said, shut it down, come back to us, and we'll, we'll give you a lot more. But uh, I, I wasn't ready to do that. I, I was committed to what I was founding. And, um, and I doubled down on Change Labs. And then a couple of months later, uh, you know, I got, uh, we, we got at Change Labs some significant deals. Who would have known? And this is where I say chance. I mean, who would have known that a couple months after I was asked to shut down my company, uh, you know, we would get major, major deals with major governments around the world and be able to build some of the most exciting entrepreneurship programs in the world. Nobody would have been able to tell. And, you know, yes, hard work plays a role, but chance plays a role. And, and whether you call chance God or, or the heavens or, or anything, uh, chance and God or wh whatever you believe in plays a role beyond just your personal uh, success or, or hard work. Now, today, in 2019, Change Labs, uh, the, you know, the accelerator I founded, the company I founded was, was rated a top 10 MENA accelerator by Magnet. Uh, we're running programs in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Egypt, multiple programs a year. We're working with companies like Amazon, we're, with governments, with the Dutch Development Bank. So we've made tremendous progress since founding. And, and, and none of that would have been possible without, of course, hard work and chance. And, and I'm very blessed to be here. We've worked with startups in the education space, in the health and health tech space, in the agri-tech space. These are some examples. Uh, we've worked with dozens of startups in the MENA region, and, and it's been really an honor for me to do so. Uh, and again, we're trusted now by entrepreneurs, by supporting uh, organizations, by governments. You know, it's really nice to find that when, when a government or a, a development bank from Europe issues a new RFP, they call us and say, hey, Change Labs, we want you guys to apply. You know, two years ago, three years ago, that was unimaginable. Nobody even knew who we were. So it's really uh, exciting to be here today with you guys. Here's some quick um, 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 stats on how far we've come. And it's really, again, it's an honor to be, to be here. Uh, and then I want to jump right into my topic today. I've given you some background on who I am for those of you that don't know me and how I got here. Uh, I'd like to now spend some time on the next, what I believe is the next trillion dollar opportunity because I think every one of you needs to know this and can take advantage of it for your own good. Whether you run a business, whether you're an entrepreneur that has a startup, uh, whether you're a young student seeking employment, regardless of where you are in life, I believe you can take advantage of this trillion dollar opportunity that I'm about to talk about. Uh, it's, it's a once in a lifetime kind of opportunity. And of course, what I'm talking about is impact investing, right? The global impact investing market totaled $500 billion at the end of 2018. Uh, okay, and, and, and by the way, when I started writing this presentation, I called it the next billion dollar opportunity. And then, you know, over the course of writing it, I had to change it to trillion. I mean, that's, that's the kind of market we're looking at here. It's a trillion, it's a trillion, it's going to be a trillion dollar market very soon, right? And, and, and why, and understanding why that is and understanding what that means for us and for companies around the MENA region is critically important in remaining competitive and in taking a leadership role over time. And so you'll notice that, you know, the interest amongst the general population and millennials is increasing, okay, in sustainable investing. But why, why, why is that happening? I bet you know this, but you, don't, you just maybe never thought about it, but you know it. You know that your aunt is starting to eat healthy. You know that your friends are trying to stay away from meat, for example, and doing a little bit more vegetarian. You know that the restaurant you usually go to has now launched a vegan menu option. You know that McDonald's has just launched the Impossible Burger and you're wondering why the hell are they doing that? And you're also noticing that, you know, companies are now focusing on green energy. That when you see advertisements by Shell, 
Shell Oil or some of the other big major oil companies, you find them talking about green, green energy. Why? You know, why are all these companies, both large and small, talking about green energy now, talking about vegetarian food, talking about organic food? You may have gone to the supermarket and suddenly you see an organic aisle. There's a whole aisle just for organic foods. They're priced much more expensively, but they're all there suddenly. They appear. These are signs. These are flags, right? That consumers, both the general population and especially millennials, the younger generations that are coming up, are demanding a, a ethical products, sustainable products, green products. They want products that when they spend their money, they'd like to know that the products they're buying uh, were sourced from the right places, are healthy, improve outcomes, and do not harm them, right? But the major change that's taken place, I think, in the last a couple of years, so you, you guys are aware about the organic, about the, the food, the green energy, right, the health, okay, changes happening in the world. And, this, and, and, and these changes, by the way, are going to create billions of dollars of value, and they're going to save billions of dollars of money as well, because when you uh, rely less on uh, uh, it's resources that waste water. For example, using the beef example, when you can rely less on beef, beef consumes huge amounts of water. Right? One kilogram of beef takes massive amounts of water to grow, whereas a kilogram of the vegetables used in your vegan burger take a lot less. And when you do that, you save money and the world saves value. Okay. And in addition, when you start making investments in these new uh, areas, you also create value. And so but again, I wanted to mention what's, what's important on this slide is that the, the key factor to note or the key changes that have taken place more recently is that millennials and older generations now understand that it's not just the right thing to do to invest in these impact enterprises or in the impact market. It's also a good business. And so they're realizing, and here the table show this, that they say, you know, we believe we can actually make more money by investing in impact, higher profitability. And by the way, guys, the biggest companies of the, in the world already know this. You may not know it, but they do. They don't talk about it openly, but they know that making the right investments in products that improve outcomes for customer and community is good business, right? When, when, when Nestle starts uh, uh, launching uh, healthy products, when McDonald's or Burger King launch their vegan burgers, when the restaurant next door to you adds vegan menu items to their, to their offering, this is because they realize that it's not only the right thing to do, it's also a good business. When we start using biodegradable packaging, right? When we start uh, worrying about the impact that our plastic use has on the environment, that's the right thing to do. Of course it is, but it's also becoming good business. And I think it's, it's really important to realize that. So number one, the trends, the consumer behavior, right? The behaviors of millennials are all moving in the same direction towards impact, towards green, towards eco-friendly, okay? But what else is happening that's critically important that we have to all understand? Well, there's a massive intergenerational, once in a, in a, in a, in a sort of generation, uh, wealth transfer happening, okay? $60 trillion by 2060 is going to be passed into the hands of impact-focused millennials. The older generation will move on, the younger millennials that I'm talking about will take over the financial decisions, the investment portfolios, okay, the banks, all of the organ, the governments, all of the organizations that we're used to working with and dealing with that constitute uh, the current system or the current world order are going to be taken over by millennials. And in the process, $60 trillion of wealth are going to be transferred. Those are the same millennials that are demanding impact centered products. Those are the same millennials that want to buy eco-friendly packaging, that want to eat the impossible burger at McDonald's, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so what that means is that you have a massive, massive market movement happening across the world while we're alive. And we're not only seeing it and witnessing it, but we are now aware of it. And we have to think about that and apply it to our industry. What does that mean about your industry? What does that mean about your startup? How will you move your startup in that direction? Because by the way, moving your startup in that direction means better serving your customers. It means, it means making more money fundamentally. So if you understand this trillion dollar opportunity, if you really understand where it's coming from and why it's happening, 
you will move your business in that direction. Whether you're a CEO sitting at a bank or sitting at a big consumer goods company, or you're an entrepreneur with a young startup. And, and I think this is what Change Labs you know, was built upon. Change Labs, the organization that I founded, co-founded, was built on helping startups move in the direction of impact. And it was helping impact-centered entrepreneurs succeed. And again, what you'll notice in this sector is that 50% of impact investing organizations made their first investment in the last 10 years. So it's a new sector. There's not much experience, okay? It's still new. The, the cards have not been dealt yet. And for some people, when they hear that, they might think to themselves, oh my goodness, that's risky because nobody's done it before. I don't know if it works. There's a lot of learnings, you know? Sure, that's one way of thinking about it. But the other really good way of thinking about it, especially where we are, is, oh my God, that's a, that's a phenomenal opportunity for me to take the lead. And again, you all know that in the Middle East, you know, we struggle to lead. We often follow, right? We, we follow the Western world. We follow Europe and the United States. We follow Asia, okay? Uh, this is an opportunity where the cards have not been dealt yet. So if we do things right, if we play it right, we can actually take the lead. We can launch products and services that are global leaders. And again, just an additional data point for you all. Uh, if you look at where the capital is coming from, where the investments are coming from, you'll find that the US and Canada and Western Europe together represent about 80% of the impact investors. So again, we're, 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 we're missing the boat. It's time for us to come together and start making impact investing a, a, an integral part of our strategy, especially given that, if you think about it, guys, the opportunity is the biggest in the developing world because impact investing requires big problems to solve, right? Social enterprises, companies that make money while also solving challenges, are, are mostly the, of the few, the one, those are gonna be based in the developing world now and in the future, okay? So massive opportunity. I want you guys to think about it. I don't have a lot of time today to go into all of the details, but I do want you guys to think about this incredible opportunity that's happening right before your eyes and take advantage of it. Consider it, consider launching a new product, consider trying to do something about it. You can take the lead. The cards have not been dealt. Okay, in technology, guys, we're 10, 15, 25, whatever it is, years behind. In impact investing and impact, we are not, not yet. And so I think we have an opportunity. Let me end with a few tips that I think are gonna, are gonna be very valuable and that I've, you know, things that I've learned over the course of my journey, right? They may not apply to you, but number one is follow your heart no matter what. Remember the story where I, I went to business school, one of the top business schools in the world, and I wasn't there because, you know, I, I was there because I was following my heart. I wanted to be near someone. And, and that was one of the closest schools. And I applied. I didn't even think I could get in. I really did not think I could get in. But I got in. I got a merit-based scholarship. And it was a defining moment in my career. So follow your heart. Uh, take risks early on. But, of course, calculated risks. Take risks early on. But uh, risks that are aligned with what you believe in and what you're passionate about. Okay, don't be afraid to lead. Don't be afraid to go where other people have not gone. Society, your friends, your family, everybody around you put so much pressure on you to do certain things and to choose a certain way. You don't have to do it. Choose your own way, okay? Empathy is greater than ego. Empathy is always greater than ego, guys. It's not about me, me, me. It's about teams. It's about helping other people. That's the most rewarding thing you can ever do. It's not about making a ton of money for yourself and, and, and living in a castle on a hill alone. It's really about uh, being empathetic and helping others. And lastly, the last thing I'm gonna leave you with is question absolutely everything. Nothing is, uh, is, is or not much is set in stone. Everything can change. Uh, and so I ask you to question everything around you from the food you eat uh, to the energy you consume uh, to the roads you use. Everything uh, can be changed and can be improved. And every one of those things is an opportunity and a business opportunity specifically. So I'm going to leave you with that. I really appreciate your time today. Thanks for tuning in. If you want more information, follow up changelabs.me and reach out and I'm happy to, uh, to, to get to know you. My email, for those of you who would like it, is karim, K-A-R-I-M, at changelabsme.org. Feel free to email me. Happy to meet anybody and, uh, and, and, and uh, look forward to seeing you all very soon. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Thank you for this amazing talk. Have you ever thought about certain practices that can help you change your culture? Well, this topic will be tackled in the upcoming panel 
moderated by Lauren Millen, founder and CEO of the LMD Group, speaker Belinda Bell, director of the Cambridge Social Ventures. Please give them a hand. Hello everyone, this is Francesco Caracolici from Italy, Global Director at US Mac. Uh, we select the best companies from startup ecosystems and bring them to the Silicon Valley when they raise money and become successful. Today with me, I have Belinda Bell. Belinda, she's absolutely amazing and she's the Program Director at the and Social Entrepreneurship Center at Cambridge University. And today we would like to talk about diversity and inclusion and the best practices to build an amazing company culture. Belinda, do you wanna say something about yourself? Yeah, sure, thanks Francesca, nice to be here. Hello everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Dr. Belinda Bell. I work at the University of Cambridge in the Business School where we have a Centre for Social Innovation. And what we're interested in understanding is how we can make the world a better place. And partly that's through doing business differently. There are other ways as well, like you know, doing politics differently or doing society differently. But I particularly focus on social enterprise and building different types of businesses. Um, my background is in starting, I started a number of social enterprises in different sectors. So I've got a range of experiences, but my kind of specialism is in this, this world of doing business differently. From a diversity and inclusion perspective, social enterprise is a very diverse space. Um, in all sorts of ways, and we can talk about that. Um, but I also have some kind of private interests. I sit on a, a board for um, I'm the chair of a charity that uh, supports transgender children and their families. So through kind of a number of experiences, I've really come to centre diversity in my practice in a way that wasn't the case when I was when I was younger. It's been something that I've kind of learnt about as life's gone on and, and grown into. Great, cool. So if you don't mind, I'll start with the first question. So the the worst thing uh the, the worst thing uh, when we talk about inclusion and diversity is that a lot of people are not included in the society because of included that there's no easy for 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 a lot of minorities to get a job like it's easy for white men in the state so where have you seen so far the biggest like struggle for minorities in general and where do you see the total absence of inclusion right now so I guess when I think about inclusion, um, I think about it as, as a case of equity and equality. And so, um, so it's really hard to get away from intersectionality, that people who are excluded are excluded because they are women and they're poor or because they're black and their men uh, because they're disabled and they're gay. You know, um, for those of us who uh, come from privileged positions, um, we have to recognize that it's, it's, there can be privilege in all sorts of minority groups um, and there's discrimination against minority groups across the board, obviously. But what I'm always seeing is this, in terms of the startup scene, the intersection of kind of lack of opportunity, which comes down to inequality of income, inequality of financial resources, and how that intersects with other disadvantages to do with you know, societal discrimination. So it's all kind of tied up in this big mess, but we should be clear that capitalism and enterprise as currently done is contributing to uh, exacerbating that inequality and so unless we do it differently then we're contributing to the problems that we that we see cool. yeah makes a lot of sense and so uh i'm i'm shooting another question so from what i've seen in my experience after working with thousands of startups i've seen that there are like let's say that let's call it underserved group of founder that because they are black women or maybe like could be gay, could be disabled, etc. They they are not taken as in consideration as they peer. They are white black men. So the start there's a market where you can get for for a VC that you can get a super high level founder with a super low valuation because other VC won't consider him. And that's my personal take on the inclusion part in the VC world. But where are, according to you the benefit of having a diversified culture within your company and a high level of inclusiveness within your company? So, I mean, I think I'd have to reflect that question back at you because like in my view, 
we do inclusion because it's the right thing. Uh, it is just the just thing, and it's the thing we should be doing. So in that sense, I actually don't care if it's an advantageous or disadvantageous to my companies because it's the right thing to do. And we don't, I don't think we should have to uh, couch inclusion in any other terms than it being the right thing to do. Now, the evidence, of course, is that more diverse organizations are more successful. So the, um, the place where we have the most evidence of that is about women on boards. So if you have women on your boards, you're more likely to be successful. But it's not exactly rocket science to imagine that the more different types of brains we bring in to thinking about problems, the, the more likely we're going to be to be good at solving them. Um, and of course, that means different types of brains in all sorts of ways. So that, you know, it does include kind of, you know, neurodiversity and, and non-visible disabilities or non-visible differences. So doing inclusion like, isn't necessarily easy. It's kind of effortful. And we, you, you have to um, kind of purposefully and consciously set out about it. But for me, certainly, we do that because it's the right thing to do. And then as an advantage that flows out, kind of a positive externality of that is that we know that more diverse companies are more successful. Yeah, no, definitely, I totally get it. But, um, so the let's focus on the hiring process, okay? So the hiring process is still conducted by people and people have prejudice or people just have subconscious way of thinking. So if I'm a hiring manager and I think that men are, subconsciously think that men are better than women because I was born in a specific wrong culture, mm -hmm. I will still hire men, not women, just because it's subconsciously I think so. So as a result, so we have board member or C-level executive, they will be all men. Mm -hmm. So maybe having a, let's say, a, an, an overview on how a diversified board or our diversified C-level executive board work and is better than a old white, white man's one, actually will give me some sort of understanding of I should hire more women because that's the way my company would be better. Because in my opinion, I'm not being misogynist, I'm just being me. Mm, mm. That's what, what I'm thinking. And the thing is, is it's really hard to train people out of unconscious bias because it's unconscious. So like by definition, we can't train ourselves out of it. Um, so we need to set um, a strategies up and methodologies up in particularly in the hiring process to make sure that we counteract for that, for that sort of thing. And some of this stuff's really easy, you know, like taking, removing people's names from uh, the, the giveaway, perhaps their gender, perhaps their ethnicity from application forms. Um, you know, just getting people in the door is, is a good start. Um, so the, there are lots of, of kind of well, um, tried methodologies, although the kind of the kind of groundbreaking university research in that is that is a paper about uh, when they introduced um, uh, hiring in um, orchestras uh, where you couldn't see the the, the musician and, and then massively uh, increased the number of women in orchestras as a result of doing that. Um, so there are there are things we can do, but I think. There's a, one really important point that I think lots of people who when they think about hiring don't necessarily understand because people say. Oh, but what if the best person for this job is this particular demographic, you know, the same demographic as everybody else? And my answer to that is, if you've already got seven white men, then the next best, the person who's the best person for the next job in this organization at this time is not a white man. So um, the, the, because a job is not, it, it doesn't operate at, it, it, it floating in the ether on its own. A job is a job within an organization at this time. And so you could be less good at being the accountant, but you're still better at, the, at fitting into the organization at the time to give it the diversity it needs. And I think people really have to get over that idea of recruiting for the best person for the job being measured in one set of ways rather than the best person to be in this role in this organization and I say this particularly but not actually um, because it's very easy to critique white men um, but actually the most recent company I looked at in this situation uh, actually uh, they were the I was scrolling through their senior staff and there was sort of 12 women um, and this organization works in the law in family law and I was thinking well this is this is not very approachable family law organization for for, for a man if all the senior staff are women and so it works both ways uh, and also once you've got 12 senior 
female lawyers, you're going to struggle to recruit a senior male lawyer. So doing diversity well and early really matters or it becomes very difficult because your culture doesn't look welcoming. Mm -hmm. Cool. So let's suppose I'm a founder. OK, so let's suppose I'm, I'm, I'm I don't know, like a C-level executive in a corporate. What are the strategy, given that the problem is actually subconscious most of the time or a good percentage of the time, what are the strategy in practice that I can use right now to increase the, the level of diversity and inclusiveness that I have in my business? What would you suggest me to do? So the first thing is definitely to uh, think about how you recruit. And so if we recruit from amongst our mates, then we're going to recruit a bunch of people that look like us and act like us and think like us, which is going to make us less good as organisations. Um, so it is about recruiting properly, which means what, reaching outside of your own networks. And the tendency, particularly at startup, but in fact, as we go through, is for people to recruit people that they know. And that's kind of a real problem in this world. So my first sort of recommendation is to recruit properly and sensibly and that also means going as far as thinking about where you advertise um because you can advertise in you know um uh, in in media that's aimed at the lgbtq community or aimed at ethnic minority communities or whatever you can use language really differently and there's loads of great resources about this on the internet about how the use of particular language particularly actually in startup uh, is very off-putting to certain groups of people and so you can be more purposeful about it and essentially if you end up with a short list of all people who look like each other then you think to yourself, okay, we obviously haven't done this well enough. We'll go back again and try and get a, a, a broader shortlist. So it is, as I say, effortful, but of course it's worth it in the long run. Cool. That's great. There's, there's a lot of great insights. And so what do you actually think of the next five years from in tech in general or in the business world in general? Do you think we are closer to get the to get uh, acceptable inclusiveness level there will be a lot of diversification next five years do you think the the problem is so eradicated into our mind that five years is not going to be enough yeah i mean it's you know it's problematic on a, on a good day i could um i could try to be positive about this mm -hmm. um but my experience uh is that the startup accelerators and incubators are kind of uh, incredibly kind of macho environments. The language around them in the in, in the in the whole is, is really macho and really off-putting. To when I say macho, it's not just about off-putting to women, but that also is likely to be off-putting to people from ethnic minorities as well. So there's that. There's also the terrible preponderance of old white men in the investment community. Um, so although our so I'm I'm based in Cambridge, where um, our Cambridge Angels try their best, but you know, the vast majority of their members are old white men. And it yeah. makes it extremely difficult, um, both for women to feel comfortable in that environment, but also in particular to, pr to um, present um, women specific businesses. And we're seeing, uh, I'm sure you're seeing these too, Fra um, Francesco, um, uh, lots of kind of apps to do with menopause and all these sorts of things, which are starting to kind of float around. Uh, and that's a kind of taboo subject, which frankly, the market is enormous and would have been um, exploited much, much earlier if menopause was something that was effective men. But we know that some male investment panels simply won't uh, kind of give due regard to a kind of woman specific business because they find it embarrassing to talk about women or something. So I think we've got a really long way to go. One of our big investment funds in Cambridge only this week advertised a panel with four white men uh, without apparently noticing that this was not something that was acceptable in 2020. So, you know, um, I don't have, I, I don't really feel that the trajectory we're on will inevitably lead to improvement unless we do something about it. Cool. So if I can share my two cents. So I've seen that in, uh, in Europe, we are in a much better situation than in the States. Mm -hmm. So I've seen things in the States that actually scared me out. I've seen, I have one of my, one of my favorite startups. She, she built a plus $300, $300 million company and 120 employees she's absolutely great and i've seen people questioning her and question her expertise just because she was a female founder mm -hmm. and on the same at the same time her co-founder was a white man and he never received such this kind of question he never received questions say i'm not sure you can achieve this i'm not sure you able to overcome this challenge 
And to be honest, the, I mean, I'm obviously this is, I've never seen anything like, like that in Europe. So I, I feel kind of lucky. And I think we're much better than the situation in the States. On another note, I think that uh, to be honest, like most of the decision that people make in at every level, from the from the from the government level to the smaller founder and startups in the world, they're all made by human perception. So if I perceive you as a funny, interesting guy, I would be more likely to hire you than the other guy that is kind of dull and really and and really unpleasant to stay with. And most of the time people still, and no, 100% of the time, you tend to like people that look like you and think like you. So as a result, more white men in power will give power to all the white men, but it is not, it's not something, I don't wanna justify anyone and the problem is real and we do something about that. But this is something that is actually really wired into our mind. And there's not a lot we can do just educating people, but forcing them to hire more women or hire specific minorities. Not just because it's right, but also because it's good for the business. And in this case, I think people will start thinking the good way. Mm. Yeah, well, it, clearly, particularly with what's happened with Black Lives Matter over the over this last year, uh, the conversations are more are more 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 prevalent than than they were. Uh, but you're right, in particular, in the investment space, about that kind of trope of oh, an investor say, well, could I go for a drink with this person? Uh, and that's not necessarily the best way to make investment decisions, although it's a very common way, right? And um, if that's what we're picturing, then we're not going to picture. A, the sort of person we wouldn't go for a drink with, whoever that might be. So that's that's kind of problematic. Definitely, definitely. So we have time for one last question. Mm. And so Belinda, it's COVID time. <laughs> everything is fast and everything is changing every day, but most of all, everything is remote working today. Yeah. So how did this crisis help diversity if it did, or how did it not help? Yeah, so uh, to be honest, I feel more positive than I have. This is, in my view, the, the best chance we've got in my lifetime to drive more equality into our societies. And so there's lots, the, the possibilities here are terrific from remote working. So all those people who are disabled, who were previously told that this work could not be done remotely, which was routinely told to disabled people. It now turns out that an awful lot of work could be done remotely. And so we've like seen the automatic inclusion of people, but also we've seen the kind of flexibility around people's lives, the acknowledgement that people do have kids in the background or life in the background, both men and women. Um, so, oh, sorry. Um, so that's really changed changed in my view the the, the, the situation. Um, that said, we're also seeing the unreasonable uh, balance of domestic work ending up with women, unsurprisingly. Uh, and so that's uh, the counter to that is that whilst we're working remotely, it's women who are doing most of the work rather than men uh, the, the the housework. And secondly, of course, we do still have a digital divide at some level when we're talking about, you know, kids and, and young people who might become entrepreneurs. You know, that is much harder when, you, when you're trying to do your schoolwork and you don't all have a computer or a laptop or whatever in the household you're sharing, let alone just have enough resources. And so I think there's lots that's very, very hopeful about our current situation. But as I say, with this stuff, it takes purposeful consideration because I'm kind of thinking about, well, how's this all panning out for people with hearing impairments forever, right? You know, there's all this sort of stuff. We need to actively think about it because if we actually think about it, we can contribute to making it more impactful. Cool. Belinda, thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for all your answer insight. Yeah, I think that's all we can do a wrap up and uh, thank you again. And I wish you an amazing rest of your day. Thank, thank you. you, Belinda. Thanks, Francesco. Nice to meet you. Um...